Hello. Goodbye. Very cool. Program. Oh, they're, I just think happy thoughts. That's how I do it. All right, so good? Happy? Everyone cool enough, warm enough? A little warm, Ed? We have some water. You want water? Too hot. <laughs> Oh, too much fun. Uh, Michael, uh, Michael will grab a uh, power strip and we can get it to where it's plugged in right next to you. Oh, yeah, just throw it in the office. You want to set it up that way? <laughs> oh, this one? Yeah, I'm a little to the... Michael move that one. Michael. Yeah. You'll once you'll you'll adjust that camera. Feeds live, we're recording. Is this on? It's on. I'm just waiting for the Okay. All right. Push record. Push record. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to uh, this week's Thoughtful Thursday. Uh, this evening is actually going to be a little bit, I would call it negative. We're going to talk a lot about bad food, food that's causing lots of problems in a talk that actually focuses on the anti-nutrient American diet. Um, this was actually one of my uh, uh, very uh, wonderful first sort of stabs at being a presenter. And so I really love this talk because I think it, it, it takes me back to a place to where this was kind of my only thing that I knew was that there was something wrong with the way most people, and myself including, were eating at the time that I was really understanding health and nutrition. And so this talk really kind of sets back to a good rudimentary structure. And I hope that anybody who's sitting here, you've moved a little bit outside of this place. But like all of the talks that we do here on the week-to-week -week basis, a little bit of the reason I think that we talk on this subject is so that many people sitting here can go into those normal food selection places and have the proper conversation material to really make an effect and see a change happening around somebody. I don't know how many times I did the very nonchalant, and when I say nonchalant, and you understand I'm not a very suave or very... Um, PC kind of person. So I would see somebody do the, you know, frozen waffles, two bags of potato chips, half a pound of ice cream on. And I'm like, so, you know, it's going to kill you. Right. 
And literally that was like this beginning steps and stages of me really getting into health was that setting, you know, and watching people. And again, I was just recently that person. So it was one of those where it was fresh. Um, but it really became a focal point for me to spend that time learning how to speak to a person who kind of didn't see the problem in something like actually eating um, that style of food and the effects it had on the body. Most people, one of the things about this concept, the anti-nutrient diet, they don't feel it for a long time. And therefore, they believe it's okay because it's not affecting me today. I'm feeling just perfect. There's no major issues happening or, or anything bothering me. I'm going to keep running this for 5, 10, 20, however many years your body will hold out until all of a sudden something gives away. And when that happens, then we go, how did this happen? My two and a half gallon per ice cream, you know, habit per day, I don't understand how I have diabetic condition now and I've got type 2 happening inside my body. Well, let me just think about this for two seconds. So you eat a bunch of lactose, milk sugar, with a bunch of cane sugar, with a bunch of sorbitol or aspartame or fake sugars, and then you wonder why you have a problem processing sugar. Um, it's unique because, again, this was those first steps in waking people up. And that's why I want everyone here today to kind of go through this with me and get some of these pieces and these details so they can walk into um, that situation, family member setting, um, sitting around a table, even with Thanksgiving. Um, that was one of these big battlegrounds at first was, well, you have to still eat crappy food on holidays. And it took me about two or three years, and I realized, no, you don't. No, you, you really don't. You're like, it's still maybe nice to have a bite of normal, you know, standard, uh, good old Plymouth Rock, you know, home, you know, home cooking food, but it's not the norm. And it's something that when you really take this seriously, uh, and I'm always asking people, how serious are you in your health? Um, you'll really start to make those steps all year round. Um, uh, so this is really one of those great places. I really hope that the contents, the details in here, are something that maybe will help you have that conversation. Look forward to sparking up these topics around the barbecue since we're you know, walking into the summertime here and getting people to think about these things. Uh, so as we do every Thursday, uh, we are going to be starting our event here with the conscious breathing exercise and giving ourselves the first moment to probably today breathe fully, um, unless you're a person who, like myself, woke up this morning 25 minutes earlier than what I thought I should uh, and actually you know, went and took care of that. Getting this practice every Thursday, I love being that influencer, but it's one of those where, again, I love the fact of people coming and saying, you know, I started doing what you were saying about driving in the car, and it actually does make the entire trip better. I don't know what's happening or why, but, you know, really give yourself this little bit of, uh, of, of a break. And um, for everybody who's been here, who's finding this video uh, through uh, the YouTube channel or online through Ustream, um, you know, what we do is we take a really long inhalation, a good deep breath, really feel, fill the entire lung cavity, feel the stomach expand, um, hold that for a few seconds of that seven seconds, and then you're just letting it all out for eight. You'll do that twice, and then you'll take 30 seconds of just nothing really happening. I'll be quiet for just a little bit, and then we'll go into the rest of the discussion for this evening. Uh, so if you'll join me, uh, really focus on that under diaphragm, really get that area there activated when you're breathing. So seven seconds of breath in. Holding, and eight seconds of breath out. All the way down to that nothing spot, fantastic. Seven seconds of breath in. And eight seconds of breath out. Fantastic. Welcome. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Val. So it's time for confession. That's kind of the beginning of this conversation. Um, hi, my name's Joe. I have a severe love in my life. It's called Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. 
and I find myself whenever I do have those uh, beautiful opportunities to quote unquote sneak one, especially out of communal candy dishes. That's the tiny little guy wrapped in that. I go, eh, that's okay. Um, it's unique because I think everybody does that to where we have something that we like to keep us on that place of saying, oh, you know, normal food, normal life. But most of us have kind of stepped away from that uh, philosophy of that food is just food and there's no real effect on the human body. Um, and we understand with the title tonight being anti-nutrient um, in the American diet system, I have found and with tonight we'll outline and identify some of the categories for these foods that it's not just that they're bad for you to where they maybe hurt you, make you feel weird, give you a headache or, or what in. It's the fact that a lot of these foods are what take away the potential for good health in the human body. So when I say anti-nutrient, it's what I'm really trying to discuss here is the idea that by consuming them, especially routinely, your body's going to be losing something. It's going to be hurting a certain tissue, a certain part of the body, um, having direct effect and damage. Uh, here at Raw Revelations, we love to promote and, and be able to say to people there are other options. You can have really, really amazing peanut butter cups that actually are made healthfully and with good intention um, instead of just picking up that standard packaged store-bought variety material. Luckily, for people who've been in health for a long time, it used to be all about wheat germ, a little bit of nutritional yeast was maybe a big you know, topic, uh, wheatgrass juicing was another big place to go to. The market has changed so drastically in the last 10 years to support healthy living function that no longer can I really say that there's an excuse, but I agree that there's still an addiction that's occurring when it comes to bad food. And it's definitely something that plays a part and has an effect on the way that we shop the way that we choose our food and our materials. And for so many people in my personal experience and working with them, coaching them through changing their health, the moment we remove some of the topics, uh, some of the items we're going to talk about tonight, they see their health change. And that's where I know that there's something powerful happening because obviously when you just do a single sometimes item elimination uh, from the diet, it has a drastic effect on the way the health of the system is working. So... I really want to understand, because I've come from that place, fully admitted, you know, fully um, repented, redeemed, whatever you want to call it, that eating a lot of trans fats, highly processed fast foods that are in packages with full of preservatives, artificial sugars, things that take away from the actual function of the food, Toxin materials, even worse when something you think is actually supposed to be food and it turns out that pretty much everything in that is actually a bad compound for the human body. Really getting into a lot of the uh, conventional dairy farming, conventional meat production, egg you know, and chicken production, uh, the xeno hormones that are injected into food systems, you know, getting into the pharmaceutical concept and the fact that a lot of people are given compounds that are known to cause issues and damage and effects in the body. I don't think anybody sitting here today, well, um, has been able to turn on the TV, a standard TV station, for more than about 20 minutes without hearing of at least one product that it's supposed to get rid of things like watery eyes. And then what it does is it actually causes sleeplessness, vomiting, skin irritations, irritable, dis you know, your, uh, your, um, Irritable uh, discharge, like it just is crazy when you hear what something, and it's like, well, wait a minute, is really dry eyes that bad, or you know, like what? Why would you do this to yourself? Um, when we see, uh, and again, as we go through this topic, and we'll see some very big victories that have occurred, it's a lot of times because of people like you in this room who've decided to choose health that certain items have been removed, and that's huge when you sit back and realize that a lot of us probably feel frustrated. We see that grocery stores haven't gotten any smaller. Um, a lot of times you can walk in and there's not a lot of people there, so that's a huge positive. Um, natural health food uh, chains and restaurants and places like this um, promote health and wellness in all avenues, bless you. Uh, and it really is something that we want to try to get to that understanding point because the more people we're able to expertly, um, intelligently, 
talk about because I like I say in my, my example, a lot of times I started off with the that's just going to kill you. And no, it's not. I eat this every day. Well, okay, you're right. But the funny thing is, is that do you see what it's happening over time? Uh, do you feel that effect? Uh, do you know that it's maybe causing the stomach irritation that you feel that you're now maybe on other pharmaceuticals for, or the pancreatitis that's turned into type 2 diabetes, or the constant headaches, major muscle aches, major inflammation, skin irritations, things that obviously you deal with. And a lot of people go, I don't know where this is coming from. And that's that big revelation that I think um, most people need to step into and understand. It's something you're doing, and that's a big piece in this. There's a lot of power in finally saying, yeah, I did this, and going, I'm going to figure out a way to undo this. And that's a big place where I think a lot of us come into natural healing and effects to get into a better place. Again, Keep up with uh, with the way things are going for me. If there's questions, anything that's personal, great stories, just just go ahead, feel free, because this is all about you know sharing through this process and getting people to understand where we are. Um, yes. Yeah, that's a big issue. Um, we're going to talk about GMOs. Um, the concept there is that, that we see a lot of products with that labeling that states natural. And we have this whole concept that, for some reason, natural is good. But, you know, we can find mercury, aluminum, lead naturally in nature and even in plants and in food naturally without actually seeing it be added to an issue for the body. Um, the GMO issue is a definite one where technically they say all we did was take the DNA of a fish, and which is occurring naturally, and we, nat we put it into this uh, tomato, which is natural. And so really, that's natural, right? Fish and tomatoes, they mate all the time and make really weird things. Like that's, that happens. There's no problems there. Um, with the GMO issue, we've become enthralled in science and with the, you know, with the manipulation of things like genes um, and DNA, and it's really created a short-changing and very corporate promoting system that has allowed health, you know, human health and nutrition to take a backseat um, without understanding. Go ahead. Correct. Does it mean non-GMO in this country? That's that's a big place in there. You're exactly right. The organic labeling system, USDA organic, actually doesn't mean that it's completely free of GMO product. Um, we're one of the few countries where we don't have that designation. The international system for understanding organic certification maintains and, and focuses on the, the, uh, the reduction and the elimination to where not even any part of the process can be containing any sort of GMO plants or even GMO animals. One of the big things we're going to talk about here is the compound aspartame is actually a GMO byproduct from bacterium con uh, consuming sugars and the liquid extract that comes away from that process is what we call aspartame. So we play with the E. coli bacteria it then consumes the sugar system. We then suck the liquid off and call it aspartame and put it in food. Um, so it's a unique process that we are understanding here. Um, and that's one of those where when you see something, look for that non-GMO you know, label. It's a huge effect. Um, there recently was an article to kind of keep us on a very uh, current event sort of thing that, that showed or that said, oh, the problem with non-GMO labeling is that they don't have to abide by all the organic standards. That's not technically true. It is one of those things where a lot of farmers who are non-GMO still abide by and are labeled as organic. It's best when you can have both of those in our country because that's the only way to truthfully be for sure on the contents of that product. But this is also one of those where when we get to the end here, we'll talk about the solution systems for this country. And it's the idea that you should be looking for ways of knowing the person growing your and, and making your foods, doing some of it yourself even, which is way more, con you know, if you want to be a control freak, grow your own food, man. That's the way to really know what's going on inside the process. Um, but if you're shaking the hand of the person doing it and you're hearing what they go through and how, you know, how their process works, uh, it's definitely something to consider. So it, it is a big issue. We do have a, a major problem here. Uh, and it's funny how 
I think the number is close to 93% of Americans actually want GMO labeling, and yet for some reason every state that puts up any kind of uh, really good legislation for this to make it to where it's not just a suggestion but making it mandatory, um, very quickly does it get eroded down. Um, the last time in California that we actually put that to a vote, I think it was Prop 37, um, it took them I think close to six or, s was it, no, six or seven billion dollars that they actually spent in order to try to undo that concept. And the whole, the whole fear tactic that came out was you were going to spend 270 something or 212 dollars more per month on food if they had to label it. Um, what's funny is they've been labeling food for 15 years now, non-GMO, organic, and the price of food didn't skyrocket because of it. Um, it's just one of those things where when you make a company who only produces GMO product and they have to change every single box, every single package, they're just trying to say, we're going to make you pay for that because you made us do it. And it's really a consumer-based system. Um, we'll, we'll, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, as we go into the rest of this evening. So it's unique because, again, we're in a place where the entire environment of this country, living in America, as great as it is and as much as I love this country for everything that's happening here, we've sort of allowed the general environment to become extremely toxic in itself with major amounts of air pollution, tremendous amounts of water pollution. We've let compounds like fluorine, chlorine, and bromine be used inside our actual water purification systems. We've allowed for plastic containers to technically take over our lifestyles, which allow for compounds like bisphenol A um, to come into the body and be in contact with the foods and the liquids that you're eating on a routine basis. Um, We've promoted a system of health care that allows for the constant vaccination system for the ability for you to maintain a strong immune system, which is very counterintuitive because shoving more virus in your body does not technically make you a healthier person. Uh, so it's a, a, unique, a unique understanding that we have. We really have promoted um, a large agricultural production system out there that pref prefers large dumping of aerial pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, larvicides, and our food system very rarely is ever clean to the point to where it actually is taken away from a field and given back to us as good whole food and nutrition. Um, it's unique because compounds like coffee are treated this way, and we don't understand that because we just think a brewed cup of coffee, there's nothing really that goes in it if you get it black, so it's got to be healthy. The amount of compound per uh, per, um, per pound uh, that's usually put on coffee beans is anywhere between six to seven in the actual field process. So six to seven pounds of fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, larvicides are used in the process of bringing one pound of bean in order to get it here to this country for the most part. And we definitely want to try to get people to understand making choices to get us out of that system uh, and into a better programs are very, very health promoting, environmental promoting, uh, and they don't require too much extra work. Yes? Correct. <laughs> right? The harder the plastic, the better it is, truthfully. Um, so it is one of those to where Tupperware itself, uh, yes, it still contains chemical compounds that are not good for, uh, for the human body. Combined plastic with microwave energy and radiation, you have a really, really bad scenario for the leaching of different plastic compounds into food products. Uh, <laughs> right, right. And that's just one of those to where... After um, <laughs> Betty Crocker and Sarah Lee came out, we, we dumbed our food preparation system down to where everything needed to be ready in five minutes. And if it wasn't, then you weren't doing enough with the rest of your life. Um, and we became enthralled with this idea, whereas before, good food took a while to make, and we knew that. And it was a day-long process, and it was definitely something that we enjoyed. Uh, and everyone knew that it was a process that we really wanted to continue. But with plastics, Sunlight damages them and causes them to leach into especially water, so water bottles become a huge problem. We finally did have a victory 
of getting things to be PBA free and removing PBA, bisphenol A. The interesting part of that argument is there are still on average anywhere between 30 to 40,000 chemicals in most plastic compounds. We just haven't proven yet that they actually cause direct damage to the human system. Um, so they've removed one and now we have the rest of those to get rid of. Whereas things like stainless steel, um, glass, copper actually benefit a human for being able to be in contact with food. Um, so yeah, we see tremendous issue there. But Tupperware, as a company, um, before we even understood, comp you know, plastic toxicity, um, we, you know, it is the harder the plastic, though, the better. But never use them in conjunction with the microwave. That's that's the big piece there. Well, Myron does that. This is an energetic water car uh, water carrying system, um, so it does this whole. The, there is some truth to that. Flaska, I've not heard of that name or that brand. This is from Sweden. <laughs> I wonder if it's Myron. It may be another name for it, or like a. Oh, it is clear. It's not colored. Hmm. I'll have to look. Hmm. We'll have to check it out. I do know that there was someone who came to one of our Thoughtful Thursdays a few months ago, and they had uh, something from, I think, Norway that was kind of like that. And it was a little personal water carrier with like a little screw top thing to it. And it had, I don't know if Val, if you remember, yeah, that conversation. I think it was uh, Christian, if I remember correctly, Christian that had that. Um, and there was a technology. I don't know, again, what it exactly was. It sounds a little similar. But Myron does a little bit of that. There's uh, energetic wavelength on the purple, ul the ultraviolet spectrum here um, with 390 angstroms light that actually intensifies the energy. Correct. Put your water in. It will actually intensify the energetic platform of that. Yeah, definite benefits. Um, again, heavy metal toxicity became a major issue in this country um, post-World War II. Uh, we really had a tremendous amount of our uh, country go towards factory and industrialization, and the constant uh, leaching of different compounds from these, uh, these industrial uh, processes are now ever present in our water system, our air system, um, and just our daily activities even have exposed us to so much more of these particular compounds. There was a study done uh, early 2000s that actually took fish samples from I believe close to two to three hundred locations across all of North America and found that there was 100 percent saturation of mercury. There wasn't a sample they pulled out of any body of water that at least didn't have detectable presence of mercury. We knew it was in there. Um, the unique thing, though, is is that we've gone from a place where we know it's in the water to allowing for complex fluorescent light, CFLs, to come into our house, which when one of those ex explodes, or if you ever drop or break one, uh, according to the package and the EPA standards and guidelines for, and regulations for cleanup, you're supposed to remove every porous material within 15 feet of one of those lights breaking. So if you would drop one in your house, you're supposed to cut your carpet, rip your drywall out, take out all uh, any type of wood. Um, the only thing you're allowed to leave technically is some styles of tile. Um, but even those, technically, if they're in direct contact, actually will allow for surface interaction and transmission of large doses of mercury. Correct. Uh, every time. CFLs, the ones that are supposedly going to save you all this money on your electricity bill. Um, the little coil wrapped ones, um, one of the most toxic things we actually put inside our houses. Even the un, they still, that's exactly right. I did a long time ago and <laughs> it's definitely one of those where it's unique because we just, it sounded great. It was fun. We were saving energy and that was a big push for a long time and the idea was they, you know, developed something that bringing in the new technology actually exposed us more. I mean, who knew that by having a light-up, wind-up um, 
clock on your dresser was exposing you to high doses of radon for the first 20 years of developing the glow in the dark technology. Um, we, no one knew. They just, oh yeah, that's fun. But you could literally put a Geiger counter in front of those watches uh, and literally have a high dose of radiation be walking with you or sleeping next to you every single night. Uh, yes. No, no, no. The, if they're glow in the dark, if it glows in the dark, it glows. It's radioactive. Regular wind-up clocks, yeah, but yeah, but it does actually create the exposure, and we just had no idea. LCD screen TVs, the lithium batteries in our cell phones, all of those are doing a little bit of this, you know, general damage. Like I say, trying not to be, I mean, we'll turn the corner here and get into some really good things about all of this. Uh, and the pharmaceutical system since 1913, oh, go ahead. HD is a projection system, um, but no, uh, LCDs, uh, the liquid crystal system is, a, is again one of those, it's better than plasma but it still has a tremendous amount of heavy metals that are inside the production system for that for that TV system to exist. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Correct. It's been interesting. It's it's really Of course, windows are preferred. Yes, definitely. Um yes. No, if it's just a light bulb emitting a, a stream of photons, that's perfectly fine. Oh, the plastic ones. Um, yeah, don't let them eat them. As long as they're away from your body, yeah, those they're not the same as the old radon clocks. That's they they have changed, and they're using different styles of plastics and different bioluminescent materials now, which aren't toxic anymore. But in the original, you know, the original development of glow in the dark, we thought that was so cool, um, and little did we know what we were putting right on top of our our, our body systems. Um, again, 1913, uh, the creation of the FDA, and the pharmaceutical system has been booming ever since. And this is a tremendous material that our bodies and a lot of people trust it to think that it's you know on that health platform as being the way to go for solving human issues when there's just a ton of opportunity to find natural solutions that cause no additional body damage that you can start to learn and operate with um, and again this is just a huge way of of discerning for yourself uh, how to get control on the actual environment that you live in um, so with all of this, the main reason we're going over this in detail is that you're being exposed on such a routine basis to all of these compounds, no matter really how well you live, because it's in the water, it's in the air, it's in the foods. You can do a lot to try to eliminate and reduce it, but it is tough because it's kind of a toxic soup out there. And one of the big things about going through this talk is to understand we've got to make a few changes personally, and then we can start seeing major effects when the, the total social and the total product and corporate uh, generation system that's out there. Um, it's unique because when we invented the concept of canola oil, uh, what we were looking for was a shelf-stable product that we could put into packages that would be shipped overseas on boats and ferries without the oils going rancid like you would in normal butter or lard. And we developed an oil that technically never went rancid. The sad issue that I think we kind of didn't understand is that we also didn't have a system in our body for breaking it down. And over these years, these trans fats actually have developed a way of sedimenting inside our vascular system and causing a tremendous level of heart disease, heart attack, arthrosclerosis, and a ton of other issues carried along with that whole problem. Um, as we got the hydrogenation of oils, one of the biggest key points in this to understand and to let people to really get the math behind this and I think it makes it very simple is that it takes about 120 to 130 degrees to even start to liquefy a hydrogenated oil so when you're dealing with a polysaturated fat it's unique because we actually don't want that trans fat in our bodies because we will never be that temperature to make it a liquid, to keep it at a liquid uh, system. When you're using things like olive oil or, you know, again, non-hydrogenated oils, they stay liquid and they're actually good at room temperature, which is fantastic because our bodies are usually warmer than room temperature. Um, 
again, it's one of those to where this process is something that actually was developed right around World War I in order for us to be able to ship food for long durations and not have it go, uh, not have it go rancid. Um, now we have hydrogenated oils. Fast forward to 1994, the stat here is that it's actually directly attributed to killing 20,000 people a year. Um, indirectly, it's probably you know in the hundreds of thousands to close to millions. But the idea is they could directly find people who had full 100% blockage in different carotid arteries um, uh, and different vascular structures inside hearts, creating heart attacks and strokes um, from just this uh, these these hydrogenated oils. Um, a lot of processed foods um, are really uh, going to be focused on this because they need the high level preservation and so that always goes back to a fun little rule that I do and that is if it's in a box or a bag it probably shouldn't be in your in your fridge or in your cupboard um, it's tough because again the idea, idea that something doesn't break down ever means that it's hard for your body to digest um, I think still the longest running person out there who's recording the breakdown and taking photographs of McDonald's food showing that they just never deteriorate I think is somewhere between 12 to 15 years so they've had the same happy meal sitting on the counter for 12 to 15 years and not seeing any breakdown occur no rot no deterioration no mold no anything showing that the foods actually being absorbed into the natural system so it's unique because this process develops a lot um, of damage and a lot of processing issues inside a person just the same. Um, we see that again a raise and one of the big myths in terms of health is that there is a such thing as good or bad cholesterol. There is no real separation in your body. We've been able to size them. LDL is very low and large. Very low lipid proteins are even bigger. HDLs are actually a little smaller and they seem to float in the bloodstream a little bit easier. But it's unique because our body produces cholesterol in all these forms for different styles of healing. And especially when we're inflamed for actually doing functions like clotting our arteries and, and when we have, or any kind of lacerations or scrapes or anything where we have um, bleeding occurring, they assist in that process. When you form a scab, it's actually platelets and cholesterol that are doing that process of developing the blood clot to stop you from bleeding out. Um, cholesterol is in a, in a, in a double uh, bonded system surrounding every single cell in your human body. You are technically a walking pile of cholesterol. That's how you exist. Uh, otherwise, you would be an amoeba and we'd all have a completely different conversation here about human health. Um, but the funny thing that we go back to is understanding that the war against cholesterol is something that wasn't helped by any of this process for creating very undigestible fats that were going into the human body system. Um, and it's unique because this is one of these places where we actually scored a huge victory. Trans fats are not allowed in food production in our country anymore. It took 40 years to create the case and to show enough detail and enough studies done to remove it, but it finally was removed. And again, 10 to 15 years ago, 20 years ago, labeling started happening to where zero trans fats was on everything in a grocery store. Now it's almost a given. You just aren't having trans fats being put into most food products. Um, so it's unique because we really do see a lot of issues uh, from obesity to heart disease, uh, even Alzheimer's, stroke conditions, infertility, uh, 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 IBS, IBD, or stomach irritation is a definite contributing function from years spent eating processed food with high trans fat values. Um, so that's one where luckily today I don't have to say try to stay away from it. It's been removed. We, we actually won on that one. It's better for human health. Most of the foods out there, we don't have trans fats in the diet. But here's a unique one, and here's one of these counter -argu intuitive arguments. Healthy grains, healthy whole grains, became a solution system for about 20 years in this country for solving everything from obesity to heart disease to general uh, weight loss, or uh, um, uh, not weight loss, but uh, um, a lot of really uh, interesting issues inside the gut system. Um, and it's funny how healthy 
heart healthy grains became the way to promote everything from Cheerios uh, down to just really good flour. Um, and it's it's interesting because when we look at that food pyramid from the days before, 12 servings of grain per day is a diet full of material that actually creates more inflammation, brain dysfunction, IBS, and general fatigue in a person than what we would have ever seen without. A lot of grains create a lot of really slow, really un, you know, non-functioning individuals. And it's unique because obviously in America we produce on average, um, I think it's 63% of all farm land is going to the production of some style of grain. So we are literally grain committed and therefore pro-grain to be able to sell it in stores. Um, this has changed. We're not doing, you know, the big 10 to 11, uh, 7 to 11 servings, 7 to 12 servings uh, anymore. We've seen some effects that go on, uh, but we have discovered that because the majority of our country produces this grain product, our ability to have it be in our foods is still very tough to be removal, you know, removing it from our systems. This is where the GMO conversation, I think, really comes in because when they started producing not only the just genetically hybridized or natural form of manipulation of plants, um, but when they started GMO production in wheats, they started adding the BT toxin system, which again, it's unique to me that we actually live in a country where if the toxins inside the actual seed it germinates and grows a plant where the toxins in every single tissue of the plant not just sprayed on or not put into the water or something where it's in the soil to where it picks it up and it's a part of the the growth process but it's in every single cell if an insect eats that material it causes their stomach system to essentially erupt and explode and it causes that insect to die the great concept here was that we would be using less compound and the and the insects would learn to stay away from food that kills them and that's kind of the way the natural world works anything that kills an animal anything that kills something it typically learns to adapt from eating that that particular product um, what we have found is almost the exact opposite we are using more of this compound we're using additional pesticides it's actually now to where we have bugs that are perfectly okay eating this compound that's supposed to kill them and eradicate them and yet it's humans who are receiving more of the damage to where gluten containing compounds made from GMO wheat uh, corn that's GMO soy that's GMO and even now we're starting to see them push forward to the idea of GMO everything from broccoli to lettuce to tomatoes cucumbers they're really going after all of it um, Hawaii won one of the best you know places where we had a big fight is the pineapple and mango is they said no we're not doing GMO product here anymore a lot of countries 161 out of the 240 that are out there have said we don't want GMO production food in our country for some weird reason I don't know still today yet why but we as a country have not said that we say go ahead and bring it on use it as much as possible. Um, it's starting to change in turn. Public interest is really starting to help us here. But we definitely have an you know epidemic now of IBS, IBD, Crohn's disease. Um, uh, we have a lot of people who are developing um, what's the celiac disease to where you're seeing the compound, the toxin be carried by and with gluten. And therefore the reactivity to gluten is a very natural reaction. It really has nothing to do with the gluten per se. There's a few percentage of people who have a natural allergy to gluten, but most people are allergic to gliophosphate and BT toxin coming into their body on the gluten molecules that are contained inside the flours and the breads. Go ahead. Yes, of course. So the question was, uh, people who have these illnesses, are they able to get better? Yes. Um, Again, as long as surgery hasn't been done to where they've removed most of your intestines, which is a very common practice, um, very sad when that occurs, but it's definitely something where, you know, that's, that's a different story. Um, once you stop ingesting the compound, 
a lot of people see an instantaneous turnaround and a very huge benefit to their body. Their very typical either constipation or full diarrhea goes away. Their joint pain starts to go away. Brain fog starts to eliminate. Mood balance starts to occur. Hormone production starts to actually balance itself. Um, it's unique because then you can start the healing process of actually repairing that damaged tissue once it's no longer being irritated uh, and, and the, the amount of inflammation occurring. So yes, it is a healable, curable concept. You may not ever be unallergic or you know, be able to completely remove the allergy now to the compound because your immune system knows gluten equals this type of damage. And it's very smart, and it tries to keep you away from things that could be hurting you or killing you. Um, but it's, it is very interesting that, yes, you can heal your system. 100% belief has to occur behind the idea that if you're doing what you're doing, it's going to create some healing in your body. Uh, there's a ton of amazing products for rehabbing from these, these issues. Um, one of the big contributors to a lot of our obesity um, is this concept of leptin resistance and the inability for your body to break down carbohydrates um, that we see occurring in a lot of individuals. And it's because the carbohydrates were containing these particular molecules causing uh, a lot of the disruption in our ability uh, to actually uh, break down foods. Uh, again, one of the things is with obesity that if your body can't break it down, it has to store it. There's really no other option for it to, to be able or to or has to find some style of elimination. But for the most part, we see accumulation in the body. Uh, and we definitely see one of the most interesting things about grains, and to really drive this point home, is that in test trials, they were able to prove with, with pharmaceutical influence that if they gave you a morphine receptor blocker, they actually got it to where you did, know, you did not uh, crave or look for any type of major grain system. They have found in the brain mapping now that it actually activates the same receptor sites that morphine does. So then that's the same addictive drug as heroin, and that's why it's very interesting for people who technically say, I just can't stop eating these very high-carb, very grain-rich foods. And when I do, I get the shakes, I start sweating, my body hurts, I get upset stomachs, I start vomiting, and when I eat the bread again, I feel better because it's literally having a withdrawal symptom occurring inside the person. So it's interesting how we can start to see and understand that there's a major, major contributor here for a lot of people to get their healing to start to occur. <clears throat> Something in this country happened uh, somewhere about the end of the, maybe the 50s. I know... M&M started something whenever they started putting candy coating around chocolates, and they started giving that to a lot of people. M&Ms became very popular, and the idea of carrying around sweets as a snack was something that uh, that wasn't really too common uh, before World War II. Um, but then the interesting thing happened. We kind of went to war with a lot of countries that produced a lot of sugar, and sugar cane especially, where we get most of our sugar products. So it's very interesting in our design systems in the, from the 50s to the 70s, a lot of alternative sweeteners and compounds in order to make us feel like we're taking in sugar uh, were created. These compounds are, again, some of the most damaging uh, material that I've been able to find in any of the food production systems that we've been able to see uh, that we've talked about so far, more so than a lot of times when it comes to heavy GMO production. Um, even the trans fats, uh, to where aspartame, sucralose, high fructose corn syrup, sorbitol, equal, NutraSweet, all the different weird names they've come up with in order to talk about these compounds. Um, usually synthetic lab developments and creation, there's actually no food involved in the process at all. It's literally just chemicals being mixed into containers. And when you get a crystalline material and you put it to your tongue, the same receptor on the, the taste bud says sweet. Then they bottled that up and made that a sweetener. Um, not looking at the breakdown in the human body as secondary sort of issues and understanding how a lot of times these uh, compounds were directly affecting uh, the overall human system. Uh, one of the biggest ones I think I mentioned before, aspartame, 1965, it was, again, one of these to where they literally combined metal um, and hydrogen gas in a tank and, put it, and fill it full of acetic acid. 
and that was their it, so there's no food anywhere in that process and yet they get a sweet liquid um, so it's unique to me that again they started putting this in everything in marketing low cal low or no sugar and the idea was that this was going to be healthy for you if we could stop people from eating a bunch of sugar we could stop their weight gain and we could help benefit their bodies um, you know we <laughs> see this whole concept of high fructose corn syrup um, again breaking down sh uh, corn um, into a liquid sort of uh, syrupy kind of uh, compound um, corn itself can be sweet and there is some natural sugars but what they were doing was actually using bacteria to break down the outer cellulose and getting the sweetness from that um, so this high fructose corn syrup uh, sometimes is anywhere between 15 to even 1800 percent sweeter than sugar and so the idea was you could use, you know, exorbitant amounts uh, or in a very, very tiny amounts to get a really, really heavy sweetness factor coming out of it. Um, so people were liking this in the food production system, especially when we started doing a lot of processed foods um, because they could put just a small portion, make something super sweet, um, get it to where a person could actually take it on a routine basis. What we've seen is, again, a breakdown in the human body in areas like uh, muscular uh, or multiple sclerosis. Uh, muscular dystrophy. We see fibromyalgia development. We see a lot of breakdown in the pancreas. One of the interesting things about these sugars is we have no enzyme that helps us break it down. So it literally floats in the bloodstream on an everyday, all day basis, and our pancreas thinks more insulin, more insulin, more insulin. And when you overtax that, that pancreas, what happens is you develop a type 2 diabetic person. And we are close, if not already at, a one in two in our country are type 2 diabetic, according to the way that they classify blood systems. Um, again, it's unique because anybody who's over a 99 is technically pre-diabetic, and anybody who ever has a blood sugar value that goes even above 120 is diabetic. And that's not really true because diabetes is actually the inability to ever bring your blood sugar back in, under control or under a nominal value of anywhere between 80 and 120 but some people have a little extra sugar to them they're the sweet people who you love in life um, and then you have people who again maintain very very low blood sugar yes oh yeah yeah correct correct and the one thing that's very interesting about this whole sugar issue on the diabetic condition is that eat something and your blood sugar raises that's the way it's supposed to work so when they do even a fasting uh, blood test they may not have looked at what you've eaten in the last one to two days the idea is sometimes you fast for 12 hours but the blood sugar response you know again doesn't immediately drop back to 99 to make yourself to where you're considered healthy so we're we're in an interesting place where the diagnostics and the labeling system for creating a marketing platform was if you have any type of elevated blood sugar in the triple digits at all you're already having problems and we need you on medicine 140 yeah yeah and again through a lot of the material that I've seen um, from people like Dr. Perlmutter um, who did the book Grain Brain which is a fantastic one and Wheat Belly um, there's an interesting concept that above 135 Yes, there is the potential for glycogen, what's called glycogenation of proteins, which means that your flexible proteins start to become stiff and they can no longer function inside your body, which causes this very wonderful acronym called AGES, which is the age factor, ages factor. Um, and if you have too much of glycogenation, then your body shows age. It shows deterioration. Um, so it's unique because when you see a person who's consistently eating food products, especially substitute sugars that don't break down and the insulin system is over activated and constantly pumping out insulin, you develop a, comp a, 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 a symptom called insulin resistiveness. And when you're insulin resistive, that means your blood sugar is no longer responding to your actual insulin production level. So your body's always producing insulin. It's become so saturated a lot of times with insulin. Um, very rarely does the medical system test insulin. 
they always test glucose for diabetics. Very rarely do they test insulin. And that's one of those ma amazing pieces to me uh, when it comes to the, the medicines because they're giving you prescription insulin. And then they never really test the actual insulin change or insulin values that come out of the body. Debra? Is stevia a good choice? Yes, if you like stevia. Evelyn. Um, for those of us who don't, there are other alternatives. Um, there are things like xylitol and urethritol that actually do a fantastic job at being standard natural sugars. But one of the big things that I would say also for a lot of people is you don't have to go sugar free. Just understand everything you eat doesn't have to be super sweet either. You know, it's unique because we've lost our taste for bitters and for sour foods and astringent foods. And we want everything to be really sweet and really fatty, and that makes us feel good, so we just keep going back to those food choices. Um, and again, a lot of times what I think really has created this major uh, issue is the fact that we were, we've gone from a water drinking society to a sugar carbonated beverage drinking society. And so with every meal, especially fast food, the idea is you have to get a soft drink. An ice cold classic Coke with your meal is the way to go. And we were drinking a very consistent and absorbing a very large amount of liquid sugar um, even when we were eating, which is already going to raise blood sugar. Um, and that's where diabetics as a lifestyle condition, one of the things that I find is that very often they tell you you'll never be able to fix this. It's, a, it's going to be with you forever, and that's not true. Yes, you're going to always eat, but you can actually get it to where your body naturally balances the blood sugar levels. Has nothing to do with it. Has nothing to do with it. And yes, there is a correlation with being larger and having less control of your blood sugar, um, but it's not a causation issue, and it's definitely one of those where people who are overweight, very high BMIs, sometimes actually have very low blood sugar values. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Very much so. Yeah. Right. Normal blood sugar. Yeah. That's very common. Correct. Of course. And that's that unique part about a pharmaceutical system as well, too, is it creates the condition of learning to live on an, a non-wavering or non-reactive and uh, system, which is what our human body naturally is. It's reactive and it's adaptive. And it's unique because when you take a pharmaceutical at a certain dosage, like you're saying there, um, uh, Barbara, with the 500 milligrams twice a day, it's unique because if that's going to be the level your body is at, it, you, it's supposed to change and fluctuate with every meal. If you eat too late, if you are you know, in a rush, even changes the way your body digests. Yeah, that's a, and that's a very good point. Uh, well, so one of the, the – um, I don't know if everyone here keeps up with um, with who everybody is. Barbara is an amazing person who spent a lot of years actually being a diabetic counselor, uh, a diabetes educator. So – and yeah, and the RN. Um, so she's seen this process. And the years that have gone through when diabetes became an initial craze and a very large epidemic to where now it's just so commonplace that, you know, the way that they treat people in the system is very sad because it's really a disservice to human function, human body health, uh, and almost in a way, like I say, it's very odd. I know with my mother-in-law, uh, she's one of those to where she goes into the doctor's office and they go, okay, so where's your list of pharmaceuticals? I don't take any. What do you mean? 
like no one should get to your age without without being on something. Wait, are you? I mean, again, we've just come to this you know level to where we just think this is a commonplace idea. Um, but yes, it's it's very interesting, and, and it is a interesting problem that I wish we will get to the point, and I hope that there is future you know potential that health coaching or lifestyle management, doing more education and getting people to be in control of their natural system will be the first round of treatment instead of here's the drug, go ahead and eat what you like. And again, seeing people go from just taking a pill to injecting the insulin to then getting the insulin pump and living their life with the idea of being hooked up to a battery operated uh, material isn't really living. It's just management. It's a very interesting system that a lot of people are dealing with. Um, I know with the printout here, it's kind of funny because you can't really tell why the map of the United States is on the, the, uh, the slide there, uh, slide 10. Um, but it's because this sequence here is actually a video, and what it shows is the progression uh, from the late 1950s into the early 2000s that every state now has uh, a higher than 20% obesity count. So we have gone from a country that the average median body weight was 150, 160, to where now the average median body weight is, is actually 120, 140, or 220, 240. Um, we have seen this blow, you know, this, this extreme uh, body size obesity epidemic take control of our entire country. There isn't a state that hasn't escaped this. Um, we definitely have a serious problem to come at here, and it's one of those where all the factors we kind of talked about contributed to a lot of this issue. Yes? Oh, yeah. So the question was whether they've, uh, and they did actually do that. So um, all the flavored store-bought uh, 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 milk delivered to schools every single day for kids to drink sometimes twice um, a day or having multiple containers of, with it strawberry or chocolate, are very, uh, very often used um, some form of aspartame. Uh, and again, it's one of those where Aspartame itself, as a drug system, operates in the same receptors as opiates, and it's definitely a process. Sugar itself, even, just naturally, operates in the same receptor sites as what opiates are. So it creates this excitation, this happiness, this giddiness, and then we shove them back into class and wonder why they can't pay attention, so they go in and we need other drugs in order to you know, calm them back out. But it's very interesting how this, you know, very much so, is a, an affecting issue. They will a lot of times. Um, again, it's just to make it sweeter and therefore to have the kids drink the you know the material. And again, conventional dairy is is just one of those.